First three and a half years of the seven year tribulation, second three and a half years, the Battle of Armageddon happens at the end of the seven year tribulation, then you've got the thousand year millennial reign. That's the slide I finished on last time. So what we're going to look at today is Armageddon. And of course, whenever you study scripture, they're always sort of interwoven. So there's actually quite a lot that we've got to cover today. But Revelation 16, 16, it's the only place where the word Armageddon appears, and it only appears once in scripture. It's the only spot that it appears, but that's the word. The, the battle of Armageddon appears in lots of different places. So we're going to look at a few things first of all. If we turn to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and then let me pray before we get started. So Revelation 11, 15, we'll be reading from, and let me pray, because this is actually quite a complex little talk, this one. You're going to have to have your brain switched on and your pen and paper for notes. So Lord, we need your help. Jesus, I pray, come by your Holy Spirit and illuminate the word to us. Lord, I believe we live in the last days, and you say that in those last days, uh, the revelation of Daniel's prophecy, the revelation of the things that are, will be revealed to us. So I pray, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our heart, teach us the things that we need to know, things that are hidden from the world, but your word says reveal to us. So reveal them, Lord, I pray, in your word by the Holy Spirit today. Help us to have the mind and the capacity to be able to remember and comprehend and understand beyond us so that we can see this and just stand in awe of the prophetic revelation in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Let's read Revelation 11, 15 to 19. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come at the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. And those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Now, the seventh angel at the start, where it says in 15, The seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud voice in heaven. So this is the seventh trumpet. Um, the seventh trumpet, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. That seventh trumpet is the announcement of the seven bowls that are about to be poured out. So the, so the seven bowls of God's wrath, so if you're trying to take notes, seven bowls of God's wrath are the seventh trumpet. So when the seventh trumpet sounds, in that time are the seven bowls. So where we've just read this, the angel blew the seventh trumpet or the seventh angel sounded, gives a summary of what's going to happen during the time of the seventh trumpet. But then the seven bowls will give us a more detailed account of what's going to happen during that time. Now I'm going to draw some links between the verse that we just read and the other things that you may have heard of before. So verse 15 and, and 17, or 15 to 17, let's just read it again. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. <coughs> he shall reign forever and ever. That language of he shall reign forever and ever means... Jesus has returned and the millennial kingdom. So when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation, he returns and he never leaves. He returns, that's when his feet touch the ground. He will then rule on earth for a thousand years. Satan will be released at the end of the thousand years. He will then cast Satan and the demons into hell and then the new heaven and the new earth. So when Jesus returns, 
He never departs again. He comes back. And that's why wherever you see the language of his kingdom shall reign forever and ever, it's talking about Jesus returns and he will be reigning forever and ever, literally. So this seventh trumpet, which is the six bowls, because of the language here in Revelation 11, 15, that means during the seventh trumpet, Jesus returns. Somewhere in the six, seven bowls, Jesus returns. Okay, can you see it before I move on? Yeah, so you should be able to see it in verse 15 when you read it. His kingdom. Let's have a quick look at it. Then the seventh angel, that's the seventh trumpet, sounded. Remember the seventh angel sounded his seventh trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven. Also note the loud voices in heaven because how does Jesus return? With a shout, Jesus returns. With the last trumpet, Jesus returns. With the thunder and lightning in the sky, Jesus returns. So, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. When Jesus returns, the kingdom of this world becomes his kingdom. He rules, he's the Christ. So there's a, oh, there's no way I'm going to get through what I hope today. <laughs> no, it's just real probably. Yeah, I'll go as far as I can. There's a common false teaching called dominion theology getting around. And dominion theology comes from the Lord's Prayer where it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now a lot of people interpret that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we can bring heaven to earth. Now, in a sense, that is true. And, and that's where Jesus said to the apostles, this day you shall see the kingdom come. And then the following day, or later that day, I think it was the following day, he went up the Mount Transfiguration with Peter, James and John. So he declared that when he was transformed and he spoke to Moses and Elijah on the mountain, that that was the kingdom of God come. That was the kingdom of God come there where he was with Moses and Elijah up the Mount Transfiguration. The kingdom had not come to the world, the kingdom had come there. So because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, Christ dwells in us by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God has come in the sense of whenever we live in the perfect will of God, whenever we choose to lay aside our sin, lay aside our agenda, and bring ourselves under the Lordship of Christ and are in the will of God, then the manifestation of the Holy Spirit there in that place to fulfill Christ's will, the kingdom has come. In that sense, yes. But dominion of theology says that what it is, is we're commissioned to actually bring the kingdom of heaven to the whole earth. And, and that we're going to develop or establish dominion over the whole earth. In other words, the kingdom of God will come, not through a literal return of Jesus Christ, but through an establishment of the church of Jesus Christ, the gospel ruling in the world. Now, Dominion theology, when you first hear it, sounds really good because what it says is you carry the presence of God and Bethel uh, Church, which is not really a church, the doctrine that comes out of there is unbelievable, but Bethel teaches that you carry the presence of God and so therefore where you come, you bring the atmosphere or the presence of heaven. Just an absolute distortion of the Lord's Prayer, that's not what it means. Yes, you have the kingdom of God in the sense of the Holy Spirit within you, and when you exercise the will of the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is manifest in the world. We are the body of Christ in the world, so therefore through the body of Christ the kingdom is manifest. But not the world will come under dominion to the kingdom of God. Not like we can bring the kingdom of God to the world and change the world to make it like heaven on earth. That is not that prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. When does the kingdom of God come? We just read it. In, in first <coughs> Revelation 11, 15, yep. Jesus returned. Jesus brings the <coughs> kingdom of God with him and he'll rule and reign on earth literally. That's when the nations of the earth will be subject to him. So we can't usher in that kingdom. That kingdom comes when Jesus returns. But we usher in that kingdom in the sense of doing the will of the Lord, obeying Christ, sharing the gospel. So there's a measure of the kingdom come, but not the kingdom come full stop. That happens when Jesus returns. So dominion theology sort of says, you don't really even have to, and I've listened to this where they say, you don't even really have to preach the gospel. You don't even have to mention Jesus. You carry the presence of God. And so therefore you can carry the presence of God into a pub 
and just tell people what you believe God is saying about them. Never preach the gospel, never talk about Jesus and they believe you have brought the kingdom of God because you bring the presence of the kingdom with you as a believer. Absolute distortion. Okay? So we need to be clear in our mind, the kingdom of God come is the return of Jesus where he will literally rule and reign. He'll reign over the nations of the earth on earth. And in the meantime, the kingdom comes by the preaching of the gospel for all those who enter into salvation, enter into the kingdom of God, enter into that salvation. But the world itself will never do that. The scripture says that it'll get worse and worse and worse to the point where if God did not cut it short, no flesh would survive. There'll be a great falling away. And uh, in Romans 1, they believe the lie and they're handed over to their sins. Scripture after scripture indicates it will get worse, not better. So dominion theology that says we're going to bring heaven to earth is unscriptural. It's completely against what prophecy says. Prophecy says it will get worse and worse and worse and worse to the point where will there even be faith in the earth when Jesus returns? That's why in the end it's called remnant believers. That's why I've named my ministry Australian Remnant Ministries. Remnant being the last ones still faithful to Christ when he returns. We will not be saving the world. The world will get worse and worse and it will be difficult for Christians to remain Christian. But we are called to overcome. We're called to be faithful. We're called to persevere. We're called to endure. So, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. He has returned. So that means in the seventh trumpet, the seven bowls, Jesus returns somewhere in that time frame. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who was, sorry, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, Okay, so the nations of the world won't rejoice at this returning. The nations will be angry. They'll mourn. They'll hate this time. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. So when Jesus returns, it's about the return of his wrath for judgment. So people, Christians who don't like that. So this is the other problem. People who are trying to sell the gospel on the basis that God just loves you. Yes, God loved you enough to come and die on the cross for your sins. And we're in what the Bible calls the valley of decision for nearly 2,000 years. Choose Christ. Choose Christ. That's why we preach the gospel. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price of your sins. Humble yourself, repent, become a disciple, follow Jesus, follow him through baptism, become one of his disciples, come into the kingdom of God. Now is the time to make that choice because when Jesus returns, that choice is finished. Because when he returns, he comes to judge. Verse 18. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. The time of the dead will be raised and they shall be judged. Now, don't jump to conclusions that this is the all people raised. This is, I believe, actually the raising of the Christian dead. Because straight after it says, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. So this resurrection at the return of Christ is the resurrection of the saints and they will be judged. We, we get judged to receive reward, not judged for our sin. Because remember, Jesus Christ washed away our sins and we all said, you know, I judge not even myself. We shall not be judged. The Bible teaches that we shall not be judged in the sense of our sin, found guilty. That, that's not going to happen for us. Jesus has taken our sin from us. We've been redeemed. The uh, substitutionary atonement, it's gone. We no longer have that. And in God's eyes, we are without sin because they've been washed away by the blood of Jesus. But we still get judged, and our judgment is for reward. Have you followed Christ? Have you obeyed his command? Have you submitted to his will? Are you doing what he asks? Now, this lines up with a lot of parables. I'm going to talk about those who are uh, given much, you know, they, they're given 100, 60, 30, and then there was the wicked guy who said, you know, you're a horrible master, so I went and buried what you gave me, and he unburied it and gave it back to him, and he said, you wicked servant, you know, so we are given things from God, given things that we're supposed to multiply, use, so we're given gifts, 
We're given the gospel. We're given understanding. So we're supposed to share that understanding. We're supposed to give the gospel to other people. We're supposed to use our gifts for the furthering of God's kingdom so that when he comes, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, not you wicked servant who buried your gift. So, so whenever I preach about the return of Christ, a lot of Christians go, oh, why, do you, why worry about that? It'll uh, pan out theory. It'll all pan out. It'll be okay. <laughs> you know, I'm saved, so I'll be good. So the Bible actually says to watch and be aware of those times because there's things we need to do. But the opposite actually happens in my understanding, that when you start to understand that Jesus is about to return, you go, hold on, when he returns, he's going to judge me. Just as we're ready. The believers will be raised, so that means those who are dead in Christ will be raised, raised first. If we are alive, we'll be caught up with him in the air. When that happens and we're resurrected to be with Christ, our judgment takes place for reward at that point in time. The great white throne judgment is at the end of the thousand years where we will see the rest of the dead raised for judgment, which is a different thing. So there are two resurrections. Let's have a look at Revelation chapter 20. Move to the right a little bit. Revelation 20, verse 1 to 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So if you bound him for a thousand years, that means this is at the start of the millennium. So if we go back a slide... If he's bound for a thousand years, it's at the Battle of Armageddon that Satan gets bound. So at the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns. Prior to the start of the millennium, Jesus binds Satan. So that means the Battle of Armageddon, the return of Christ, is where Satan is bound, because he's bound for a thousand years. So back to our verse, Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Right, so if the saints are raised from the dead because it's talking about those who did not, those who had been beheaded at the start of a thousand years, those ones who were beheaded are raised and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. So there as well in Revelation 20, you can see that at the start of the millennium, at the end of the tribulation, the saints are raised. At the return of Christ, the saints are raised. They are judged for reward. And it says they reign, rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So therefore the saints have to be resurrected before the tribulation, sorry, before the millennium starts, so that they will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Right? So we are raised, if you die before Jesus' return, you will be raised prior to the millennium. And you will be given rewards from him. You will be judged for reward, not judged for punishment. That happens later. Verse 5. Five. But the rest of the dead, that's all the others who are not believers, the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. So we have two resurrections. So if you're trying to take notes and keep track of things, we've got two resurrections. We've got the resurrection at the start of the millennium and the resurrection at the end of the millennium. The resurrection at the start of the millennium are the saints resurrected for reward. The resurrection at the end of the millennium are the rest of the dead. So if the saints have been raised, then the rest of the dead are all unbelieving people who have died without Christ, shall be raised at the end of the thousand years. Verse 5, so reading from Revelation 20 verse 5, But the rest of the dead did not 
live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. So which is the first resurrection? The saints at the start of the millennium, at the end of the tribulation. So blessed and holy is he who has part in that first resurrection. That's us who are genuine believers. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there it is again. Those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, when Jesus returns, shall be raised, shall be judged, to be rewarded. And part of that reward is that we will rule and reign. So not just watch Jesus for a thousand years. We'll actually rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So in the millennium, you're going to have work to do. In the millennium, you're going to be ruling and reigning. God, Jesus is going to give you a job. And you'll have work to do. And that work will be to rule and reign. Oof. Just let that soak in a little bit. You know, whenever I study eschatology, I always go, really? But then I look back and I think all the prophecies about Jesus and that have been literally fulfilled to this point. You know, Jesus, we shared communion, the Passover. Jesus was crucified on the day of Passover as the Passover lamb, literally on the day of Passover. Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost, that's why the Holy Spirit waited for so long. He waited for the Feast of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of the Feast of Pentecost. And there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that have been literally fulfilled. Those who watched my um, little talk on our faith should be based in truth, the search for truth. I did a little talk at the end of the platform here about how to search for truth. And I compared the Bible to the Quran and other religions. And that our faith should not be based on feelings. Our faith should not be based on what reward we get out of it in this life. Our faith is based in truth. And you can't actually know the truth. So this is true. You know, Jesus, all those things happened. Jesus fulfilled all those prophecies. So there is no reason to think that what I've just talked about will not be literally fulfilled. That Jesus will return. The dead in Christ will rise. We shall be raised up to be with them in the air. We shall be judged for reward. And then when Jesus comes down and puts his feet on the ground, he shall rule and reign for a thousand years. Satan shall be bound and cast into the pit. And we will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now, that makes a lot more sense as to the, to the parable that says, if you are proven faithful in few, you will prove faithful in much. See, that parable... I realise there's a lot of light in the background. I thought I was going to get a lot further than this. <laughs> Obviously not. That parable where we think uh, we have proven faithful in a little, and then, so therefore we'll be trusted with a lot. We think that quite often you hear preaching about this earth, this life. That if I prove faithful with my money here, that God will give me more money now. But actually what it's talking about is if you prove to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ here and now, and you prove that faithfulness, you will be given great authority during that thousand year reign because he's looking for people who are humbly obedient to Christ. And that's why that salvation, that gospel message is so important. It's not about getting rich. It's not about the benefits of salvation. It's about dying to self, following Christ and he being truly your Lord. Because then that faithfulness now will turn into, yes, you were proved faithful then, now, I give you this. I want you to take care of this or look after this. You you want to rule in my authority in this area or whatever. And I firmly believe that because remember when Jesus comes, he's still in bodily form. He'll rule and reign from Jerusalem because he's not going to rule as like God all over the earth in that sense, you know, omnipresent, like the spirit of God. Like now Jesus rules in our life and in the saints throughout the world by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you as it dwells in me. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The church of Jesus Christ all over the world has the Holy Spirit in them. But when Jesus returns, he has taken on bodily form and he shall rule and reign from Jerusalem in bodily form. He will literally be on earth ruling. He will exercise that ruling of the earth via the saints. We shall rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Do you see that? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
And this is why I reckon Satan just wants this kept hidden from Christians. Don't preach about eschatology. We don't need to know about that. You know, let's just love each other. And there's this whole thing that Jesus has revealed to us that's going to happen. This is why it's so important to get the gospel right. Because it's not... So many people fall away. I've been watching online all these big uh, names, singers and bands and so forth, where they're actually losing their faith, the great falling away. And I listened to them and I realised, well, what on earth were you believing in? And they believed in a religion. They believed that uh, by coming to Jesus that he would help them, that he would heal them, that he would provide a way. And tomorrow when I preach, I'm going to be preaching about the Red Sea Crossing. I'm going to show you how to manipulate scripture because I'm going to preach it the way a false preacher would and then help everybody see why that's wrong. And that is when you personalise text, when you make the story about you, the story is not about us. The story is about Jesus. Jesus is everything. He's the Christ. He's the rock. He's the Messiah. It's all about him. So therefore, all the stories are revealing him and the gospel. And all we need to do is die to ourselves, be humbly obedient to follow Christ, do what he says. It's not that hard, but in our pride and our rebellion. And I've said this again before. I'll say it again. I've preached about the need to be baptised. Don't go away and pray if you need to be baptised. Just obey. The Bible says repent and be baptised. So that's why it's important at the start of your faith, you start on the right foot. Faith is you die to yourself, you weigh up the cost, you obey. The first commandment is repent and be baptised. So you don't go praying and asking for a special invitation or a special exemption. You just read the text, repent and be baptised, and you obey it. So what that does, it sets up a... Christian life that says my life as a Christian is about humble obedience to Christ and those who prove to be faithful shall be given much responsibility during the millennial reign you will rule and reign with Christ because you have proven yourself to be humbly faithfully obedient to Christ Amen Amen. Wow, I've got three slides with about six points on each slide and that's taking me 20 minutes for one <laughs> we'll see how we go. We'll work through it. Um, so we are reading from Revelation chapter 11. We've been looking at verse 15 and 17, and then we went to oh yeah, Revelation 21 to 6, the millennium. Let's move on. Verse 18. So go back to Revelation 11, and let's have a look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name. Isn't that interesting? And those who fear your name. So the fear of the Lord is actually a good thing. The fear of the Lord produces obedience. Those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. If you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, so that's back to the right. Oh, sorry, back to the left. <laughs> I'm going left and talking right. Back to the left. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But I do not want you, I mean, keep your finger in. Um, Revelation 11, because we'll keep flicking back to Revelation 11. So, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So the context of what I'm about to read is Paul, yeah, Paul wrote Thessalonians, didn't you? Yeah, Paul comforting these believers. So what's happening with these believers is that they know that Jesus is going to return. And so their concern is, well, when Jesus returns and ushers in the kingdom, we're alive, that's okay, that'll be good. We're here, Jesus will return, and we'll rule and reign with Christ. But what about our brothers and sisters who have died? So he is about to give them comfort in the truth about your brothers and sisters in Christ who have died. So this is the context that this is written in. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, tick, which we do, even so, God will bring him those who sleep in Jesus. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. When Jesus returns, 
He will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So that means if you're asking the question, where do we go when we die? Your spirit or something of your essence, I, I don't know how to describe that, spirit, soul, something that, that of you that's not flesh, goes to be with the Lord and when he returns, he brings you with him. So this is Jesus, sorry, inspiration, Jesus through Paul, to these believers, giving them encouragement. What's going on with our brothers and sisters in Christ who have died? We're alive and Jesus is going to come, that's good, but what about my brother who died, who believed in you and so forth? What about them? And he's saying to them, be encouraged, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, he shall return with them. So therefore their souls, their spirit is with God in heaven, with Jesus in heaven, and when he returns he's going to bring them with him. Who sleep in Jesus, verse 15, for this we say to you, by the word of the Lord. So in other words, this is not them. This, this indicates that Jesus told them this. That when they were alive, Jesus told them this. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. In other words, Jesus Christ himself told us this that we're telling you. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Jesus himself said to the apostles, you will not be resurrected prior or before those who have fallen asleep. Okay? So what that means is the rapture cannot take place until after the resurrection. The rapture cannot take place until after the resurrection. Let it sink in a little bit. Let's read it again, verse 15. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, this is Jesus himself, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, we won't go back to be with the Lord before those who are asleep. And it goes on, verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend, this is how it's going to happen, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, there's that shout, the voice of the archangel. And if we go back to our verse, that's why I keep the finger in both, flick back to Revelation 11. Where is the shouting? Okay. Is it verse 15? Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven. The loud voices in heaven. And when you look back in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. Alright, so this return of Christ always comes with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. There's this angels declaring the trumpet declaring, Jesus is returning. It's going to be like, this is a, not a spiritual thing where we won't actually hear it like, a, like symbolic. I believe this will actually be, we will hear this. Yeah, that yes. final trumpet will sound yes. and it's done. It's finished. When that trumpet sounds, all decisions for salvation are off. Done. Jesus now returns as judge. So that's why it's important. Anyone listening to the tape, if you have not given your life to Jesus, you need to give your life to Jesus and follow and serve Christ because you do not know when he's going to return. And when you hear that trumpet, finish. Done. Judgment will be dished out because he returns as the judge. If you want to escape that judgment, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Humbly serve him and obey him as your Lord, King, God and Saviour. Amen. Amen. Verse, verse Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That language, thus we will always be with the Lord, the Lord will reign forever, is the start of the millennium. We'll rule forever with the Lord. Because now if you go back and read a little bit of Revelation 11, in, sort of try and keep Thessalonians in your mind as we read Revelation 11, 15 again. Then the seventh angel sounded and there was a loud voice in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and about his Christ. That means Jesus returns at the seventh trumpet or during the six bowls, seven bowls. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks, 
We give you thanks, O Lord, for our Almighty, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. He's taken his power, so he's coming back in power. Great power to reign. He's not coming as the lamb to the slaughter this time. He's coming in great power to reign on the earth. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry. Yes, they will be angry because when that trumpet sounds, it's all over, it's finished. Judgment has come. And your wrath has come. So wrath, don't get confused. I know people get really worried about this wrath because they picture some angry man on earth. You know, like if you had a wrathful father who was drunk or something and beat you. So when you hear the word wrath, you think of this violent, out of control person bashing somebody else probably. God's wrath is in absolute purity and justice. He has done all he can for people to escape judgment. And the only way to escape judgment is to humble yourself, acknowledge that you are a sinner who needs to be saved. Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I'm a wretched sinner. And if I'm honest and look at my life, yes, compared to your holiness, compared to your glory, I am a wretched sinner. Yeah. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yes. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. The only way to escape this coming judgment is faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Amen. You can't, you can't earn your way out into God's favour or anything like that. Thessalonians, what are we at? Four thirteen to eighteen, which we have read. Let's go to. Let's now match up. Verse 18, so we're looking at Revelation 11, 18. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So the return of the Lord, he raises the saints for judgment, for reward, and then his wrath is poured out upon the earth in judgment. Go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 to 5. Verse 4, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ uh, for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So if you line that back up with 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18, it's the same sort of thing. Jesus is raising uh, the saints who have died and then raising those who are alive and then he returns to the earth, which is feet on the ground and judges, which matches Revelation chapter 11, which is our main verse that we're looking at, which then also matches Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment. Let's look at verse 19. So the main text we're working out of is the Revelation 11. Let's look at 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Let's look at, so always keep your finger in Revelation 11. Let's go and look at Matthew 24, 29. Matthew 24, verse 29 to 31. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation. Okay, the language can't get any plainer than that, can it? Immediately after the tribulation. So this is at the end of the tribulation. Of those days, because all of chapter 24 is about the return of Christ, the time and the end. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Okay, so if we go back to Revelation 11, verse 18, the nations were angry. How on earth would the nations be angry unless they see something or know something's happened? 
So when you match this up with Matthew, immediately after the tribulation, the, the, the world will go dark, the moon will not give its light. Now, let's think about this for a minute. The moon, will, you know, the sun will go dark, the moon will not give its light. Some people think that that's then, well, what, what happens? Does God actually remove the sun from existence? Quite often, a lot of these prophecies have a really natural fulfilment that you can miss because you're imagining things. This could simply be a massive volcano eruption that fills the atmosphere with dust and the world goes dark. Okay? But it's a cataclysmic event. This is a world-changing event. And Jesus said that unless you return, no flesh would survive. So whether this is a meteorite hits the earth, whether this is the use of nuclear weapons, whether this is a, a volcano like um, over in America, what's that national park? The volcano is about the size. Yellowstone. Yellowstone National Park. Well, that is massive, but if that <coughs> volcano erupted, um, the whole world would get dark. We'd be covered in dust. So it could be a volcano, it could be nuclear weapons, it could be an asteroid. What it is doesn't really matter. Because that's where people, you know, I can, this is what happens online. They, they get all the news <coughs> reports and all the dramatic music. No, 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 you know, meteorites going to strike the earth and they create all this, oh, what's, you know. And people remember the interpretation or the, or the drama, not the text. So we're going to try and remember the text. So let's have, have a look at it again. Matthew chapter 24, 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation. So we know that this is not going to happen until after the tribulation is going dark. And if you remember, summarise my previous talks, the tribulation is that seven year period. What indicates the start of the tribulation? He makes a covenant with many. So we were talking about this yesterday. We've got to be careful. It doesn't say sign. Because what people might be looking for is a signed agreement. And it may not actually be signed. It just says he makes a covenant with many. So that could have already happened for all we know. Um, so you've got to think, well, he, he is the Antichrist. So if we are in the last days, the Antichrist is already active. And I've got a fair idea who that is. I'll share that eventually. So he makes a covenant with many. But then in the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant, sets up the abomination that causes desolation. That's the setting up of an image. And you have to worship that image in order to be able to buy and sell and receive his mark. Now, the language sounds like a statue and we've got to go and sing, but it could be, as I've explained before, just a system. Yeah. It could be the system of the world. Yeah. You know, consumerism is not godly. Consumerism is actually quite evil. And in James, it talks about in the last days, those who oppress the poor to, to increase their wealth. Um, we can go and have a look at that. But it actually talks about this in the last days, that one of the signs of the last generation of the last day is that they oppress the poor for their own personal gain quite significantly and you know that 70% of the world's wealth is held by 20 people yeah absolute out of proportion right that is the last days we are in a generation where poor destitute people in third world countries are being used by the rich and powerful for them to become richer and more powerful so that system is evil. So, so getting the mark of the beast may not be a tattoo of 666 across your forehead, and maybe they just turn our credit card into a chip under our skin. We don't know. We don't know, but what it says is watch and be careful because it's associated with worship of the beast. So we've got to look at, is there any worship associated with it? Do not receive that mark, whatever that mark is, because those who receive that mark are cast into hell with Satan and his demons. So it is pretty evil, but Satan is deceptive. It won't, it won't be that obvious. And that's why I can't understand Christians who say, ah, oh, don't worry about studying eschatology. Well, how do you know? The mark of the beast, they could already be here for all we know. And I haven't got that far, but there's a verse that we'll get to that says the people of that time are to be watchful. We are to be watchful. We are to be discerning. We will know those times. Verse 30. So I'm in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. I'll finish up soon, probably. Depends how you go. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven. This is where everybody will see it. And the sign of the Son of Man, that's where in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, they'll get angry. You know, the world will be, will be angry because they'll see this sign. 
verse 30 in Matthew 24, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Remember, he returns in power and glory. Hallelujah. Yep, and he will send his angels with the great sound of the trumpet. There's that great sound again. And he sends his angels, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Jesus returns and sends his angels out to gather the elect. And, that, and remember, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up with him. So Jesus comes in power and authority. The dead in Christ will rise. We who are alive will change and transform to be like him in order to see him as he truly is, and we'll all go up to be with the Lord in heaven. When we're in heaven, so that's probably why there's a 45-day gap between the end of the tribulation and the, where Jesus puts his feet on the ground, the actual end, and that's where we get judged to receive reward, an allocation of things, and then he returns and puts his feet on the ground. When Jesus puts his feet on the ground, that's when the end comes for the world. You know, the trumpet is sound, but so what happens is the trumpet sounds for the gathering of the elect. So that means there, there is no secret rapture. We're not secretly going to disappear. It says in scripture that there will be this great sound, the sound of the trumpet, and they will see the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens. Why in the heavens? Because he hasn't come to earth yet. He's still in the heavens. Who goes to the heavens? We do. Those who are in Christ Jesus. So therefore, the world knows this has happened. When Jesus returns to get us, that's it. Finished. You can't then accept Jesus Christ after the rapture. It's done. Why? Because the sign of the Son of Man is heaven. All those who are Christ will be raised from the dead, changed and transformed. Will be changed and transformed. We'll go to be with him. And it says, we'll forever be with the Lord. There's no second resurrection of the saints. There's only two in scripture. The resurrection at the start of the millennium and the resurrection at the end of the millennium. The one resurrection at the start of the millennium is at the end of the tribulation, there is only one resurrection for the saints. So therefore there can't be a rapture of the church at the beginning of the tribulation and a second rapture at the end of the church for those who become Christian during the tribulation. Otherwise there would be two resurrections of saints. And that doesn't make sense, it's not scriptural. Alright? Yeah. I'll wait to see what your son has to say. <laughs> Because um, Judy's son believes that a... No, no, he agrees with me, doesn't he? he oh, that's right, yes. I'm the iffy one. I'm winning you over. <laughs> you are. Um, Matthew 24, verse 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Yes, we'll leave it there. We'll do the rest. Let's have a look at, I think we've been looking at that in our 1 Thessalonians 4. Because all these tie together with different bits of information. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Oh, I wonder if that's one. Look at the Philippians 1 and 1. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So all I'm picking up is this confirmation that the return of the Lord coming down from heaven is with a shout. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So this voice, this trumpet, this declaration happens, announces the resurrection of the saints. And in scripture and all the other verses, it indicates that the people of the world see this sign in the heavens. So therefore there is no secret rapture. They'll see this sign and they'll hear the trumpet. They'll see what's happened. We shall be raised and they shall be left. When all the church is removed and the world is left alone under Satan's rule, what's going to happen? Absolute chaos. Yep. And he is going to try and get them to side with him. He's going to come out and make out that God's the evil one, I'm the good one. Fight with me, I'll protect you. Whatever happened to those Christians, they're the cause of all our trouble. Follow me, serve with me, fight for me. And that's when he'll just play his cards fully, so to speak. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
I think this is another reason why a lot of people avoid eschatology. You really have to know, like, connect a lot of scriptures to understand what's going on. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Let's read from 50 to 53. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 to 53. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. Okay, so we know that we'll not all sleep, because when Jesus returns, some of the saints will be alive. We'll not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Hallelujah. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. There's that trumpet again. At the last trumpet. And also, which trumpet are we looking at in Revelation chapter 11? Which trumpet? The seventh trumpet. The last trumpet. And the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, contains the seven bowls, which unpacks in more detail. All I'm doing is the overview part, which is in Revelation 11 at the moment. We'll come back next week and look at it in more detail. In a moment, verse 52, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. We are not born immortal. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, you would have heard, I heard that preaching at college, teaching at college, and I still hear it a lot. Because pastors just regurgitate what they've been taught. The text clearly says we are not created immortal. We are given the gift of immortality. Mm -hmm. that, that matches more with Jesus says, I give you the gift of life. Mm -hmm. Eternal life. So your faith in Christ is more than just forgiveness for sins. When you put your faith in Christ and enter into the kingdom, he gives you the gift of eternal life. And that eternal life, when we're resurrected, this corruption shall put on incorruption, this mortal in other words, sin, death, this mortal body shall put on immortality. Now, of course, that's debatable. It's a side issue. It doesn't really matter. What matters is we know Jesus is going to return. We know Jesus is going to raise from the dead. And we know Jesus is going to give us an incorruptible, glorious body. And we're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's just finish off on Revelation chapter 16, verse 18. Sixteen, verse eighteen. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. What's that language sound like? You know the noise, the trumpet, the return of Christ. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. At the return of Christ, when his feet hit the ground, he causes an earthquake, the greatest earthquake in the history of men. And but that doesn't happen until he returns and his feet touch the ground. Now, I'll finish there because time's really up. But Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 to 21, if you just have a look at verse 12, this is to get ready for next week. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl. Okay, so all of, I'm not focusing on bowl number one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to jump to bowl number six which is in that section. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 to 21. The sixth bowl. So remember the seventh trumpet. In the seventh trumpet are the seven bowls. Next week we're going to jump straight to the sixth bowl because the sixth bowl is where the Euphrates is dried up and there's a whole thing that I want to show you about that which is going to take too long. Any questions or thoughts before I finish?